Hey everyone, hey, let's let's kick this off as it's six o'clock. So let's keep this informal. So you know, main focus in is in some cool demos and to, you know, kind of mingle around here here together with us. So it's like me, Ilka Sarpila, want to welcome everyone over here. And as speakers, we have Amir from HashiCorp. Then we have Tony Kangas from UpCloud. And then we have Jacob and Mike from Verifa. Here we can see those guys. And then our special guest from, you know, <laughs> Great Britain is, is DevOps Rob, is Rob Barnes. And I will just show you just like three to four slides and keep it very quick. And then Amir will, will continue. Yes, upcard as a company, we are almost done that. Today I looked at our Slack channel, our channel, and it was 99. So we are just about to cross, cross the border. And we have offices in, in, in two countries at the moment. We reduced the number of offices due to, to, to the pandemic, but probably we will have more offices in the future. But currently we have offices in Helsinki and, and the other one in, in, in Singapore. And our focus area is, is Europe and the other strong area is, is Asia, especially the Singapore and Malaysia area. area. And what we used to be, if you have known what upcloud was before, it was mostly infrastructure as a service. So just, you know, we gave you a cloud service and you just video set set using those cloud servers. But that's that's not what people want to buy, buy anymore. <coughs> so it's like what we used to be. And what we want to be. So this is the old, all what still brings a lot of lot of revenue to us. It's it's compute node storage and networks. So basically just build it by yourself using the infrastructure. But now we have started to make the move towards the pass, pass, so transition to pass. And that's to share the cloud native uses. And of course, that's why we are participating with, with HashiCorp as well, because those are the cloud native guys. And we see that it's the number one technology used by developers, you know, nowadays. And we, we are not competing, you know, against Amazon. So we understand that we cannot, you know, make 500 great products, but we decided to make, you know, like seven or eight most needed features instead. That would enable you to build your, your you know, your cloud native, native or build your application using using cloud native infrastructure. So it's it's UKS meets our, our new Kubernetes service, which is about to be released in, in January, and then we have database offering object storage and, and load balancer. And, and it, in the future, probably some, some observability things and, and event-driven architecture stuff like Kafka. And in, in the future, we see that 2025, when our revenue should be 100 million euros, let's see how, if it goes over, over to that, but 60% of, of the revenue would come from the traditional IAS services and 40% and for this cloud native, native things. So it's got like our motto has always been like never become yet another. And now we are really focusing on that as well because we are building quite you know special service services that, that you guys can use. So it will be basically the best home for your cloud native infrastructure. And, and we understand that we cannot succeed alone, but we need partners and, and community to, to able to, to rock the world. And of course, we want to keep things open so, so that you, you guys can contribute whatever we have available in GitHub. But that's it quite short. And so please, I mean, tell some words about HashiCorp. Let's do so. So let me take over the screen. Yes, it should work, but we will soon, soon. We'll yes. We'll soon see. Cool stuff. So, uh, ta-da. Hi, guys. I'm Eve HashiCorp, uh, represented the company HashiCorp, and Rob. Nice to see you also for the first time, actually. <laughs> it's always fun these post-COVID times that you have interlocks with people. And a lot of the people also here that I haven't seen in real life. And then suddenly they are real. So it's always good. Hope to see you more in the future. Uh, uh, I am here with also two colleagues from the Nordics, Anna over there. Say it's Anna. And Peter Preset is your new nickname from now on. <laughs> so do engage with them after this talk and, uh, and mingle with them and ask some questions. So I'm going to keep it super brief, and I'm going to talk about HashiCorp as the company. And why do I do that? Well, I thought that HashiCorp was Terraform. 
So I never understood that this was a company called HashiCorp in the background. So when I was approached by HashiCorp to, you know, become an a, a employee, I was very suspicious. This was HashiCorp, Hashi really, do you want to have like, what is that? What is that company? I made a few phone calls and suddenly, oh, they are the guys that make Terraform. And then everything made sense. And all of my customers and all of my partners at, the, at that stage, they always use HashiCorp products. And uh, this is us today. I think this is already an outdated slide. So I think we are closer to 2,700 employees. Uh, when I started two years ago, we were like 1,300. So it's really, really growing and it's really, really crazy. Um, we are an open source co uh, company. Everything we do is open source. Uh, uh, we are pretty active in the community there. Uh, we have a lot of fantastic, fantastic collaborations. And it seems that we have a let's say semi-religious community out there that love our stuff and we are super grateful for that. So um, the part that we represent is the enterprise part. So even though all of our stuff is open source, we do have enterprise versions of those and those typically uh, address uh, time to market, security governance and operational efficiency. So why is that? What, 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 what's with these uh, topics? Well, that's what the IT leaders of the biggest companies say is important for them. So we adapt and make enterprise version that, that tap into those those three stuff. And well, this is a slide that you would already know what we do. We provision, we secure, uh, we connect whatever you have. So if there's an API in your software or hardware, or even a CLI, most likely there would be something with Terraform that connects to it or the rest of our products. Um, just today I talked uh, about and with Telia, Ericsson, uh, Ikea, to name a few of these accounts, and uh, they use our stuff because one day a CIO got hired, they sold their real estate in IT, and they have everything, and they hate it, and they think it's, everything is really, really cumbersome and really, really horrible to work with. So they use our stack to kind of abstract all of that and try to have a common operating model to work against. So that's, that's what we do. So uh, basically, that's it. Uh, good to see you all. And uh, I think if I get it within five minutes, so uh, off to the next one. Okay, thank you very much, Amir. And I think the next one, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so hello, everybody. My name is Tony Gangas. I work here at AppCloud as a senior engineer. And I work with our developer tooling and Kubernetes service, which is not released yet. So. We'll have a sneak here, that as well. So today I'll be demoing how to use our Terraform CDK provider to boot up resources in our cloud. And about the presentation, I have a few slides going through what is CDK for Terraform and then how to use it compared to the Terraform itself. And as a demo, I will launch some resources in the cloud with the Terraform CDK. And because the deployment takes some time, I'm going to set the boot already. So launch the command. And then let's talk about what's happening while the Deployment is in progress, so we don't have to look at the in progress indicator on the screen for too much. So very similarly done with Terraform. We have a single command to start our deployment. And for every, anybody familiar with Terraform, we can see that the Output is very similar, and there is actually Terraform running in the background, and thus we get the Terraform output and similar comparison on what we have in the cloud and or anywhere, and what we are about to deploy. I'll get approved, and it starts creating resources, and this will take five minutes so we'll go back to the presentation and come back to this once we discuss what we just did. So what is CDK for Terraform? Cloud development kit, similar than 
I guess the inspired product behind that from AWS. And it allows you to configure Terraform configurations with programming languages. And it's available for TypeScript, Python, Java, C Sharp, and Go, from which the TypeScript is the kind of background implementation and the other languages are transpiled or compiled from the TypeScript implementation. And today's demo is written with TypeScript. TypeScript. And the idea is that you can use programming language and features from the programming language to define your resources instead of the ASICorp language. And this allows some benefits. For example, you can easily use environment variables and for loops and if statements, which might be a bit complicated in the Terraform form side. Somebody who has tried to create a resource conditionally probably has done this count hack with the ternary operator that is not the cleanest possible solution for that. And that's like one example what would be nicer on the programming language side. And also, if you find yourself wrapping your Terraform commands in TypeScript or Python scripts, this will allow you to skip one step in the process and thus be more flexible with them. Set up and start up. Um, one thing I also noticed while writing the demo for today is that the libraries provided by Hasikorp are quite nicely formatted. So, for example, if you load the prebuilt TypeScript library for our upload provider, you will see all the documentation and report function signatures in the code editor while you're writing them. Similar than with any other TypeScript or JavaScript library. And well, that's also possible with ASIC or language, but might require some more setting up, for example, in VS Code to achieve that. And while well, this brings more flexibility to the configurations, it's good to know that the CDK still compiles the configuration in the ASIC or Terraform setups. So you, we are still limited with the Terraform features. And for example, if we define Terraform inputs, we are able to use them when we deploy the resources, not during the like compilation time. So for example, if we use input as a basis for our naming, we cannot use it during the compile time to generate resources based on that. So to conclude, CDK allows you to use programming language instead of writing directly Terraform code. And how to use CDK TF providers? So these are either pre-built or compiled when taking them into use. And for example, in this demo, I will be using Pre-filed libraries for the upload provider and Kubernetes provider. And there are many of those available in the CDKT group in GitHub, including these that I will be using in the demo. And well, any other Terraform provider can also be built with the CDKT command before using them in the actual configuration. And well, this of course brings those benefits and cons as for us as a provider, it's easy because we don't have to write another provider, but we can use the Terraform provider that we already have. But on the developer experience side, it might be a bit tricky with the auto-compiled auto code or automatically generated code, especially with Golang and those other non-TypeScript 
the TypeScript alternatives that have, for example, with Golang, you have to use pointers for pretty much all of the inputs, which isn't always the most convenient thing to do. Let's go back to the demo and see how it's progressing. And I have a two step process here. So at this point, we should have had our cluster itself deployed. And we now will be creating a Kubernetes deployment and a service to expose this. Hello world application that I'm deploying to the internet. I'll approve this as well and let's see how the code itself is formed. I guess we will need a bit more tune so you can read this. Still not ideal, but we are not fit on the screen any other way. So in the Terraform CDK case, the configuration is built from stacks, where one stack is equivalent to one Terraform configuration that you will first in it and then plan and apply. And in this case, I'm using pre-built providers, so those can be installed as NPM packages from the NPM itself. So it's very easy to get started. And if you have a ready-made stack, you can get started by running NPM install and then CD key, key PF, apply or deploy. And of course, to access our cloud, you will need the credentials as well, which I pre-configured, so you will need to see my password during this presentation. And what I'm deploying is now one private network for the Kubernetes cluster, and then the cluster itself, very minimal configuration. We have an ID from the previous network component that is very easy to reference, similar than in ASIC or language as well. And the key difference here is that I can define the resource that I will be needing in another stack as a part of this stack. So object member in TypeScript language. And this works very similarly in other possible languages as well. Um, with this created cluster, I can use it as a dependency for the another stack. For example, in this case, I have split up the configuration in two stacks. One to deploy the cluster itself and another for the Kubernetes resources in the cluster to keep them separated. And probably not the best possible example for a movie stack application as these are something that you usually would like to keep separated in the different Terraform configurations anyway. And on the application side, I have configured Kubernetes provider also from the NPM registry as pre-built CDK PF provider. And I'm able to use the cluster ID from the previous stack to configure this data source and then this data source we call it the Kubernetes provider with client certificates and client keys and that sort of stuff. And then the configuration for the Kubernetes resources is very similar than in the Terraform, and in this case, very similar than in the Kubernetes manifest as well. And 
the actual part that defines this configuration is in the end we create a Terraform CDK app and then two stacks into this app where from the product one we will need the actual object so that we can pass it into the or its ID to the second one. And finally, we synthesize the application, which will do the or initialize the process of transforming this into a Terraform configuration. And I should have a complete result. And then we, we have the here outputs from the Terraform, similar, similarly done with the Terraform itself, that we can then use to check that our services online. Except it's not working. Let's see from the cloud side. So here's the cluster we created and a load balancer from the Kubernetes side that is used to expose the code running in a deployment through and service. And let's try from here with the Something went wrong. I'll have a backup for you. And here we have a simple hello world page from the bot running in a cluster deployed with the CDK here. And since this is using load balancer and multiple bots, we will should see a different host name when we do a refresh. And also the IP address will change when we land up on a different board behind the load balancer. And in this case, it's a private IP because the load balancer is connected to a private network and operating there. So we wouldn't not be able to connect to the nodes directly. And on the file system side, we will see the generated Terraform code and states in the same directory as the CDK DF itself or a subdirectory of it. So it's yeah, <laughs> good to remember that this will end up as a Terraform configuration. So we will not be able to do magic, magic trick with, with the inputs or anything that is not possible with Terraform itself, apart from the tricks with the programming language and before actually deploying. And the configurations for this demo and the upload provider are both available in GitHub. The provider in the CDK PF group that is auto generated by Hasikor whenever there is changes in the upstream packages. So as a global cloud provider for us, it's very easy to rely on these pre-built packages. And of course, if you develop something new, we can always use them on-demand builds when using the CVKT get command before deploying our stack. And similarly, the sample used in this demo is available in GitHub under the upload LDD group where the road is living 
So if anyone wants to make a closer look, it's possible through there. And that's all from the presentation side. We will have plenty of time for questions and discussions if there's any. Yeah, question. So what's your um, opinion of the CDK for TF and a provider of maturity in terms of production research? I wouldn't be too confident in using them in production setup as it's evolving very rapidly. So for example, there is major changes which will break the previous logic at the moment. So it's wouldn't say it's ready for production users at yet, but very interesting phase at the moment to test out and see how it's developing. Good question. Follow up, if you may, do you have any insight into the maybe roadmap of CKDF? I have to admit, I'm not very familiar with the okay. CCORP side of Yeah, maybe we have some expertise over here. Someone <laughs> <laughs> could answer the expert better. So, so from well, a roadmap perspective, on top of my head, no clue, but <laughs> no good. And uh, Rob. Maybe we could uh, see if we can find anything significant about that. Uh, uh, of course, roadmaps are can be a bit of sensitive topics, but that's a good thing. So I already have actually not much to use, so let's let's keep it in. And how new is this action? What's the release like? You know, this year or something like yeah. And what is like the popularity of this? Is it like you know? I would say crazy. So remember, I'm not a techie at all, and I got these uh, uh, crazy amount of followers in the various factions with various companies, and everybody from buying the question of these. So, okay, so, that's uh, cool. It's the, the interest is very, very, very high. Okay, if not anything else, maybe a 10 minutes break, and we can continue discussing about this in the thing. Oh, okay, that will be. Question. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, might be a little bit technical, but I think it's fun. Um, if you're using like vanilla Terraform, so HCL to write the stuff, if you have a root module and you create a Kubernetes cluster, you should use another life cycle, so another root module to apply stuff to the Kubernetes cluster if you're doing the Terraform, because otherwise the provider gets screwed and you end up not being able to find it at any point and stuff. Um, uh, you had like basically two root modules there, the, yep. two, the two stacks. Um, and it seemed like CDKTF handled the creation of one before the other in like one like life cycle of CDKTF. Yeah, exactly. So is that like a like is that is 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 that real? Like, <laughs> like could you could you create multiple stacks that are dependent on each other and create a whole swarm of infra from one command? And 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 if so, then how how do you plan? Like, because presumably the the plan of one stack that's dependent on another the stack would require the known values of the first stack. So I guess there's some limitations there with like planning. You can't really see what the end output would be unless you have a manual like, fly at each. Yeah, as in the example, we will see the currently planned stack in the review state. And then only after that, we will see the depending stacks yeah. status. So we will have to go through the stacks one at a time. But we can magically use the dependencies through this variables. So that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's kind of cool. I mean, if you're creating infrastructure and you have already your predefined stacks and you're replicating that multiple times and you kind of like know that, okay, I can just run this without manual approving, you can bootstrap an entire like infrastructure. Whereas even like Terraform uh, with Terragrunt as a wrapper and stuff falls short there a little bit uh, you can also yeah you guess you can also prove it as well but you yeah <laughs> yeah it's a it's a funny thing with these like because the the known values in terraform will often cause troubles even with like terragrant as a wrapper but this seems like it can yeah yeah for example in this case we will see that two terraform generated models here as a separate directory so we will see that they are separated 
as a generated terraform code or configuration, even though we define them in the same uh, .ts file and have dependencies defined there. Yeah, I see a, a lot of values in that because, yeah. There's a lot of values to that because you can't do that with vanilla terraform. True that. But exactly the case I just mentioned about you should separate your life cycles with creating Kubernetes clusters and applying stuff to them. And then you need a wrapper like Terragram or something or a bash script or, <laughs> or whatever you're going to do. I didn't actually, yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> cool. And in this case, we will be able to share these different parts or stacks as NPM packages or as a Python package as if you would be using Python, for example. So it also brings another dimension in how to share the infrastructure definitions. Yeah. Is a Terraform state stored locally or remotely? Uh, in case of this demo, locally, but it also supports remote storage. So there, there's an option to do remote state? Yeah, similar, okay. similar than in Terraform and through the same kind of API. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, you 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 ran the TDKTF CLI tool now, but I, I presume you can run this like uh, without the TDKTF command line tool. Let's say you were running it as like a some kind of web service where it's accepting API commands and then hey, go and do this stuff when you receive a so like part of a running service already, or or do you need do you have to use the TDKTF CLI? I haven't tried that, but my apps assumption would be as well that you can use it from the live program at Sorry, I've been meaning to check out CDKT for so long, and now you're giving a talk about it. So mm -hmm. <coughs> I have questions. I can keep going. <laughs> I guess in theory, what you're saying is if you had a web server that would set in notifications that's kind of event driven, then it can fire off whatever yeah. you wanted to do. And in this case, it could be CDK. Um, so, yeah, you can have, I guess, event driven infrastructure deployments. Yeah. If that's what you desire. That's how your, your stack is set up to uh, perform optimally. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess it's what people kind of like mishmash together with CI tools and other things that like. Yeah, it's just not native. Um, is is in some cases hacky, um, whereas this is just you know, it's almost like application deployment almost, but yeah. for infrastructure. Um, it's not better or worse than the vanilla thing. It's just use cases really. This is like um, what what is your use case? How do you need to deploy your infrastructure? Uh, you know, there are plenty of people out there that I speak to that could never use CDK because, you know, they, everything has to be a specific kind of query approved way and the vanilla Terraform is perfect for that. Where there are other customers out there that require a lot more flexibility and, um, you know, they kind of need, need it to operate like their applications operate. And that's just not very possible to do with vanilla Terraform. So, um, it's, it's, it's about delivering flexibility in terms of your patterns. Um, and this, this is this is just another layer of that. There's also no code execution as well, which we um, we announced that HashiConf Global. Um, so now as a developer, you don't even need to learn Terraform or CDK. You can literally just tell you what you want from that and kind of make it easy to get. So um, that, that, that's kind of the patterns we're going now. We need you where you want. Yeah, because I, I spoke with somebody who of course I can't remember his name or something now, but he was like Sashi and went and worked for Pulumi in the early days. And one of their main use cases was this like event-driven infrastructure provision. I've never really used Pulumi with that. So I'm like so yeah. <laughs> it's probably <laughs> so I guess what's the good answer. Oh, sorry? It's probably Paul Stack. Yes, yeah. Paul yeah, Stack is good. Yeah, guy. yeah, no. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I was on a podcast with him once and we discussed this. Yeah. <laughs> and that was about the only concrete use case he could come up with. <laughs> not 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 so like the little bloom, you know. That's not my intention, but that was like when we really drilled down to it. It's, I mean it's a matter of taste. Yeah. And now Palumi even released the YAML uh declarative approach to inverse code. So it's kind of like funny, like the circle of line. Uh absolutely and like dagger 
now released their Go SDK as well. So like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you start declarative, you go with code. You start with code, you go declarative eventually because <laughs> everybody has their own preferences. So. Flexibility is the name of the yeah. game. Okay, anything else? Um, yes, please. Uh, can I ask, uh, when you all, when you all were discussing about this, I was uh, thinking that the, the real life situation when you are uh, developing uh, Terraforms for some, uh, or like uh, let's say partially existing infrastructure, and you want to import some portion of uh, infrastructure that you have already. And I was thinking, uh, I don't see how would you import import uh, when you're when you'd be using <clears throat> Python to provision like bundles of Terraform like uh, resources, but then you want to import one of them into your into your uh, uh, Python bundle, whatever this is called, I'm uneducated, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how would you do it. Uh, am I looking at it wrong or is there some simple answer? Well, it's certainly possible since we are generating that Terraform point of integration, but then again, might be not the ideal case if you are generating Terraform configuration based on variables and stuff. So, <laughs> Possible, but then the plain Terraform might be a better solution as the infrastructure seems to be more stable in that case. Maybe answer a little bit more. You should look into the Terraform state. Terraform will not create something that already exists. It will just be like this thing already exists. So then you can import that into your state and that's yeah. managed by, by Terraform. So that's what I was asking. Yeah, you can do the same thing. It's, yeah. No. I know where you're going with this. So you write your Terraform wrongly, and then you write the Terraform wrong. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So then you um, can import those separate parts that already yeah. exist. You can import them in your state. But here, you don't have your like normal uh, HCL uh, uh, way of yeah. Terraform. Right. But there's still a state, right? So um, does does this uh, the CLI? I haven't played with this part. Uh, does the CLI have an import command? We're not an educated point. Let's say. see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. I haven't used this either. Yeah. They can't directly find it, at least. So I don't think it does. So that's, that's a genuine question. We need to kind of look at the use case and see how we can get it to that. Because uh, I, I fully understand what's happening here, but yeah, but in in real life, it is just a, uh, never as ideal situation where you can create everything from scratch. There's always something half done that you can need to just get on with it. Yeah, this is ideal situation where you create yeah. everything from nothing. You know, that's usually. Oh, not hang on. So there's this there's the completion class that generates a complete script. So I'm going to guess that means it generates Terraform, right? No, I think this is for the like client itself. So the bus complex is that bus complex, yeah. So from the command line uses. Uh, so is there a way to generate the just the Terraform and not running? Because if there is, then that's how we get around that you generate the Terraform. And yeah. You would run the, the import command and then it's in the state file. Yeah. And then you're good to go from there. Because if it's using Terraform under the hood, then the resource IDs are going to be uh, the same as exactly. HDL. Exactly. You just need to bring it into the state file. Yeah. Um, so what we're uh, lacking here is the Terraform import command. So, uh, no. so they can't uh, convert and, and then just uh, that's the same yeah, okay. So that's the answer. Yeah, so that's, that's basically how you would do it. Yeah. But yeah, then of course, there's this extra layer of programming language that might also make differences to your yes. generated code. So it might be that your resource exists or not, depending on other variables. So. Makes it something lovely like true. Terraform, which will security out a whole bunch of lovely ACL. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Please no. <laughs> it has its uses, but yeah, not very important. Either. Just a just a real wild guess here, but I guess you could in principle generate uh, or, or or write the CDKTF construct for the resource plan it and then based on that plan you could write your terraform import command into the particular stack that you're that you uh, write write the cdktf construct into and then just hope for the best i guess 
<laughs> That's true, but that is a horrible developer. <laughs> 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 Yeah. <clears throat> I'll be this back. Okay, let's continue this discussion and continue the actual presentation that uh, 1850, like Jacob, but we'll take the show, show then. So, nine minutes breaks. I forgot to tell there's more, more drinks and the toilets also available. So, let's <laughs> so, so begin. I'll continue. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to talk about um, how to get secrets from Hackable Vault into Kubernetes workloads. And we're not going to talk at all about how to configure hash football or like policies or 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 that. We're just going to be like, how do you get secrets into workloads and the different ways you can do that? Because uh, I've been doing it a lot for the last like year or two, and Mike has been doing it a lot recently as well. Yeah. And we well we work for Verifer. Yeah, hi, I'm Jacob. Hi, Mike. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So we we uh, we figured we'd share our experiences and 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 learnings and uh, and hopefully it's useful. We we did plan on doing a demo, mm. um, but we well we were a bit late preparing the demo, so that was one part. But then the other part was we realized the demo wouldn't be very much fun because we'd be like, hey, here's a pod and here's a secret and here's another pod and here's a secret. So uh, we we uh, actually gave a webinar last week and I put some slides together. So I, I took the slides that I made then and reduced it by about 50%. And uh, and now we didn't prepare anything for this. Um, <laughs> as I prepared last week. So so this is the improv. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is the improv half prepared presentation. Um, so I present the beginning and you present the actual technical bit. Yeah, I guess I can add the slide. Yeah, and I'll take the Argo bit because you didn't want to do that. Okay. Um, so uh, here's a really One, simple two, use case. We have a Kubernetes cluster, so that's the, the box. We have a pod running in the Kubernetes cluster, and we have some third party service. So this could be anything you want to talk to by REST API or any reason you'd need a secret in your pod. And the secret is the key or identity, because usually it's more like identity than, you know, secret. Um, and that's what we want to do. So the obvious way, I'll just, uh, the obvious approach is to create a Kubernetes secret and put the secrets in there and then mount that to the pod as a file or as environment variables or whatever uh, manually. But uh, yeah, this has some like implications, let's say. Um, you might be wondering where does that secret come from? Where else is it stored? Who's been throwing it around in Slack or who's been throwing it around in Teams? And so somebody who has access to the Kubernetes cluster actually has it there. Um, and uh, when that secret expires or if it gets lost and so you need to you know, boot the whole thing up again, then how does that work? If it's not automated, then there's a manual step that now needs to be either repeated or documented. Um, so uh, yeah. Okay, but not great. Uh, and why do we care so much? Uh, secret sprawl is the like the, the term for when secrets get passed around and secrets end up being stored in many different places, even if they get deleted, but whatever. Um, so some statistics, which I think is always useful. This was a study from IBM in 2022. Yeah, it hasn't ended yet, but 2022 as of like a month or so ago. Uh, and in 19% of the data breaches that they researched, the initial attack vector was stolen or compromised credentials. Um, so that's a, a fifth of all the data breaches were caused by stolen or compromised credentials, which is kind of fun because if we avoid secret sprawl and if we avoid throwing secrets around in Slack or emails or whatever and automate it and have a central secrets management, then I'm not going to say it solves the problem entirely, but it probably helps a great deal. Um, and this being the most 
common attack vector makes it kind of relevant. The other interesting thing is that they, uh, this actual study was about the cost of a data breach. So how much does it cost the company when a data breach occurs? And uh, the longer the life cycle of a data breach, the higher the cost. That's a clear correlation. Um, and stolen and compromised credentials had the longest life cycle. And in most cases, people didn't even know they'd been breached until much later anyway, because, you know, like, think of all the previous cases now. It's like, oh, yeah, our credentials have been out in the wild for like three months. And now we know, and now we're informing you. Um, so 243 days was the average uh, life cycle for a breach. So like from the initial attack day until it was resolved, which is quite long, uh, quite long, third of a year, two thirds of a year. Yeah. So the cost is high. Now we know why we care about this. Secret zero. So I told you I reduced the slides loads. Secret zero is kind of fun. Uh, let's say we are wanting to talk with Vault. Um, and we want to get secret out to talk with something else. Well, first of all, we need to talk with Vault. So who are we when we talk to Vault? Um, surely we need a secret to be able to talk with Vault. Um, and this is the secret zero. So what's the like initial, like the bootstrapping secret or whatever you want to call it. Um, um, so uh, just the thought there to have that um, and secret zero in the most common case in Kubernetes is to use a service account. So you could use your Kubernetes service account, get the service account token, use that to authenticate with Vault, and Vault's like, ah, you're this service account from Kubernetes, uh, you can have these secrets, and then you can get the secrets out. And that's how we do kind of like credentialless uh, authentication with Vault. Um, I mean, we still have a credential, but we don't need to pass another credential just so we can get to Vault, because the service account token gets created when we create the service account. So, uh, so that's secret zero. Uh, so our goal is that we want to get this key from Vault and use many of the secret engines that we want to uh, and get that back to our Kubernetes workload. <laughs> and we're going to look at five um, methods, tools, plugins, controllers, operators, plugins, whatever, sidecars uh, to do that. Uh, which is just the pure Vault REST API, the sidecar injector, the Vault CSI drive, external secrets, which is the community operator, and the Argo CD Vault plugin, which was a late addition, thanks to a colleague who worked on the Argo CD Vault plugin recently, and I was like, okay, let's add it in here. Um, so now we have some fun slides, and I'll pass over to Mike mm -hmm. to talk about that. Oh, uh, yeah. If you want to. Okay. Yeah. Really complicated slide. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if you really don't want any side cards, any dependencies, any containers, whatever, then you use the REST API, and you probably just you know write it in your code. Uh, but then you of course have to maintain that, um, and you know be compatible with REST API, and you know you're not really, you know, you cannot really change where the secrets come from at that point. Then you're kind of coupled to board. So. Um, but this, of course, has has its benefit as well, because as I said, there is no init containers, and basically you, you run it anywhere where you can authenticate the world and you can easily access the streams. Um, you just look over your shoulder when you need an escape. Yeah. <laughs> Next slide. Yeah. So yeah, uh, I'd say this is probably the default that um, or the the one that's I think the most popular. I don't really have any numbers or anything, but. The back that up. So what you do, you put another wall uh, <laughs> onto your workload. So what has this agent mode where where you can use it to kind of handle the the all the things for you. And what the sidecore injector is is basically a Helm chart you install into your cluster. Maybe a lot of people here have done this. And what it does is, or what you do, you add the annotations to your pod, and then this agent mode world appears as a sidecar to your pod and handles all the secret things for you so this is sort of easy but then you have the world sitting there next to you and we'll go into a bit more details later yeah yeah i i, I guess we're like doing quite a quick run through of this yeah. there will be a blog with more detail and if you want to ask us after this about anything then just do so but we've 
Rob's here from the UK, so we want to get our stuff done and he can actually, yeah, <laughs> you know, he can do the stage before everyone's too drunk or. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then there's this. So this is the sort of the second option um, from HashiProf itself to to get the secrets in there by installing something on your cluster. So, oh well, this is sort of you know the CSI driver itself is is like a Kubernetes project, but it supports vault. So basically, how that works is like here. You know, you have these volumes. You define that as part of your pod or deployment manifest. And then the, the demo set for the CS, CSI driver, make sure to add those secrets into the volume, sort of, you know, beforehand when your port starts to read the volume. Um, so that's it. Yeah, and, and you can optionally create an actual Kubernetes yeah. secret. It can sync a secret if you need to, which is useful for third, third party Helm charts and stuff where yeah. you can't actually tell it to read a, a secret file, but you need an environment variable then. Yeah. yeah, this is actually the sort of the, from the official options. This is the only way to really get those uh, Kubernetes like native secrets synced into your cluster. Um, but which is sort of wrong because this is the storage interface. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> it is there. <laughs> and yeah, this is something uh, I've used this with other things in world as well. Um, so external secrets operator. Um, again, don't try to install into your cluster. Um, but what this does is it doesn't touch your manifest or your deployments. It just gives you Kubernetes secret. And it syncs those that from you know, various places. I use with AWS, um, it's a SSM parameter store. Um, and that works you know, pretty much the same as it does with Vault. Um, so this is sort of a, a neutral solution to, just to get those Kubernetes secrets if you're into that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then and then there's me again. Uh, maybe we should call on 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 Lowry. No, I think I think I know this well enough. No. <laughs> so if you're using if you're using Argo CD for uh, deploying this stuff, there is an Argo CD vault plugin. Um, so when Argo like clones a Git repo or something, and it, it basically like templates or generates the, the ma manifest that it's going to then send to the Cube API server. Uh, you can get it to insert secrets from, for example, HashiCorp Vault. In fact, the plugin is called Hash, like Argo CD Vault plugin, because the initial provider was HashiCorp Vault, and now it supports a bunch of other stuff as well. Um, but yeah, so you basically get like YAML uh, with. A secret injected into it and you can do whatever you want with that but probably the logical thing to do is to put that in a kubernetes secret which you can then read from your workloads because you probably don't want to be putting these secrets in uh in like uh you know as arguments to your pod How, however i have been uh, i haven't done this myself so don't try this at home but i have heard and read about people who are like provisioning info with terraform and you get like um, file system IDs, uh, service, not service account, but like I am role IDs and, and stuff. Uh, <laughs> and you put that into Vault with, with Terraform as a, as, a, as a secret, but it's not really secret, it's just like a config. And then you could use this to retrieve those values. So a typical thing would be if you're using Terraform to create info and Argo to deploy your stuff, how do you pass that file system IDs and IAM roles and this kind of stuff between the two? Well, you could use Vault and the Argo CD Vault plugin to do that. Uh, it's not really a secret, but it's like, a, you know, yeah, it works. I haven't tried it, but it works. Um, yeah. What's the next? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> does anybody in HashiCorp want to talk about this? Because we don't really know anything about it yet. Yeah, I, I, I happened to read, read this book. I didn't even notice that there was some announcement recently in HashiCorp, I think. Um, in technical, right? That yeah. HashiCorp. <laughs> it doesn't even exist yet, does it? Or well, well, internally, it must exist, but yeah. No comment. Yeah. So, <laughs> all right. So, they, they basically, they were, this was really just like a couple lines in blog, uh, but they're saying they're going to do the same, exact same thing as external secrets operator. So, sync secrets from wall in the Kubernetes secrets, um, but it's official. Yeah. And hopefully they do much more than just support the KV engine, which is the only thing 
external secrets. Yeah, I was even trying to find the link from HashiConf when it was announced. HashiConf, like the one that's just been, so it's really recent. Uh, but there will be a K8 operator, I think it was called. But then if you search for K8 operator, all you get is the Terraform Cloud operator stuff. So, um, so I couldn't provide a link, but I have read it. It is on, you've read it too. It is online somewhere. Uh, if you go to like page five of Google search, you might find it. Um, I was too lazy for that. Um, but yeah, there's something coming from Ashville. Maybe next mug <laughs> hug we can, you know, talk about it. Uh, but anyway, so uh, we've shown five and the Dix approach doesn't exist yet publicly, but we've shown five approaches for getting secrets out. So which one should you use? We tried to collect some nice information, and this table is not very well formatted. But uh, on the left, you have the, the the options, and along the top, you have like some general information about it. Uh, I'll keep talking. Sorry. Yeah. No, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one of the most interesting things to note is the secrets engines that it supports. So if you only plan to use the KV secret, which at least from my experience, is quite a lot of what people use Vault for. Um, you can only use the external secrets operator and Argo Vault plugin for, for KV secrets. As soon as you want to use it as like an identity brokerage for AWS or Google Cloud or databases, whatever, then you have to use the the REST API, the sidecar, the Vault CSI. So that's like kind of like good thing to think about. Um, if you want to use different auth engines, so this is how we authenticate with Vault to get like the, the policy attached and then get the secrets out. Um, there's some limitations. Um, so uh, yeah, <laughs> good to bear that in mind. Uh, if you need Kubernetes secrets, like if you're deploying a lot of third party Helm charts, which, which I was in my case, uh, I got quite frustrated um, trying to do this with a sidecar injector. Um, so I just ended up switching to Vault CSI driver and then found that quite cumbersome and then ended up switching to the external secrets operator because it's probably the easiest way of syncing Kubernetes secrets from Vault, but that's not maybe the most secure or the best way to do it, but whatever. Um, and then secrets rotation. So if you want the secrets to be rotated without restarting your pod, this is uh, how does that get supported? And it is possible if you now have Kubernetes secrets, they get updated and amounted as files. And that was quite recent, like in Kubernetes. Quite, maybe it wasn't. I remember at one point it wasn't possible, but now it is. And I haven't been using Kubernetes that long. So it's kind of like, so you can do like hot reloading of secrets, Kubernetes secrets, if they're mounted as files as of some X time ago. Uh, but yeah. Um, you want to take the next one? Okay. I don't know what it is. It's this one. Oh, uh, yeah. Thanks. So I can give feedback on the upgrade where you mentioned. Uh, so we plan to release this as a public data around 1.13. This one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 1.13. Yeah. 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 So in human time because now it's one uh, not 12. yeah okay it's coming soon so quite soon yeah. she all right cool. uh yeah another table shall i talk about it yeah, I mean, uh, if you use the rest of the API, then your dev effort. Will you want to explain the columns first, maybe, because it's useful. What What do we mean by ops deploy endeavor? But how should I? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I guess ops is like setting up the infrastructure and maintaining it, and deployment is what kind of stuff you have to write to actually deploy these things and do the integration. And dev is like writing the application code. Seems a bit weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that, I mean, yeah, but that, but 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 that's it. I mean, if you think of this from a like platform engineering kind of perspective, like if you're the one responsible for maintaining a platform for users to use, you might want to make it easy for the developers to use it at your expense. If you're like a five-man team and you run a Kubernetes cluster and you're all developers, then no, who gives a shit about the platform cost? We'll just, you know, we'll develop our own thing and do it that way. So, I mean, this is more of a like a decision matrix of where do you pay the time to save afterwards? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And I mean, for example, here, like sidecar injector, like the deploy 
effort is high because of a lot of these annotations, templating you have to do. Um, then as with you know the REST API, if it's used the API you already kind of in there. Um, and there's no offset port because you don't have to maintain any Helm charts or anything in your clusters. Um, whereas, oh, these are all of these other options. You have to maintain something in your cluster um, in order to fetch the secrets. Um, yeah. So you, if if you're DevOps, then you just get all black boxes. <laughs> yeah. Then Wait, why why is it good? <laughs> in this case. <laughs> oh oh you mean yeah 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 ah, yeah yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I thought you meant that was in a good way. <laughs> Isn't that the goal? <laughs> it's called job security. Yeah. <laughs> it's called security. <laughs> yeah. Oh, all right. Uh, yeah, that's it. That was the last slide, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Well, I, we, we, we already talked about these. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, the, yeah, we, yeah, we did. The, the last one is interesting the decoupling. Uh, like if you if you're not actually using secrets for pods, but you want to create like your Docker config JSON to access the uh, container registry or something, then uh, I can't remember which one support that, but you can do that. Um, so that's kind of interesting way of you could store your container registry secret in bulk and have that sync to a, a Kubernetes secret that then allows your uh, nodes to pull down containers from private registries or public registries with authentication. I mean, that's, that's possible, but you don't need a uh, Kubernetes. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you need Kubernetes for that. Yeah, so it's like a field then. Manifest. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> All right. Did you say you need Kubernetes? <laughs> yeah, Kubernetes was a prerequisite for this. For any of this, any of that thing that we just talked about. Uh, yeah. And use UKS. No, sorry, we weren't paid to give this presentation. So yeah. I think one 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 point we discussed at one point was like the move the cluster point. That oh, maybe yeah. you maybe you don't want to use the Kubernetes or the OS, yeah. Yeah. Um because maybe that's like kind of per cluster. Whereas maybe if you're in AWS, you can have some yeah. roles, you have the IAM there. Yeah, that's a really good point. So yeah, the this is the this is the how does the pod authenticate with Vault to get a secret out? The kind of like obvious choice is to use the service account. But if you use a service account, you have to mount an endpoint, uh, an auth engine in Vault per Kubernetes cluster. Mm -hmm. And if you're running multiple Kubernetes clusters, um, Sure, you can do that. You can automate the Terraform or whatever, but still, it's like a you know extra thing you have to do. If you use like uh, in AWS, you could use like IAM roles for service accounts, and your pods could assume as uh, uh, an IAM role in AWS. You could actually use the AWS sort method to get the secrets out, and then you could use the same IAM role across all your clusters. Uh, but then you have to each service account in the clusters have to be able to assume the I am role and that I am role needs the right uh, like permissions for that service account to be able to inherit it. So you're kind of shifting the problem elsewhere. But yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can choose. Uh, then there's the JWT method of authenticating. So you can authenticate using basically like OIDC, but then you still need to put the public certificates for each cluster into the vault auth engine. So you still kind of like, like whichever way you go, if you want to do it nice and securely, you're going to be coupled by your clusters to vault. But just where you put the coupling is uh, a design decision, I guess, that is worth thinking about. Um, and also, uh, which method you use might also restrict you. If you've already have something in use or you're picking something, then yeah. Are we done? Uh, yeah, high five. Uh, we did this. Yeah, we did it. All right, cool. Thanks, everyone. You dare ask people. Yeah. You're leaving us all speechless. Yeah. Questions. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Good. <laughs> it's called talking fast. <laughs> <laughs> One question. Yeah. Uh, does it work with the subtract volumes which are mounted? Uh, there are secret volumes like in uh, Microsoft uh, uh, when you're using keyboard, the secrets are not, not rotated if you have uh, this uh, sub part uh, volume mounted, the secret will not uh, rotate. Does it work? You mean Azure key vault? Yes. It's not in the scope of this. <laughs> <laughs> so the keyboards, I have keyboard, so the Kubernetes does not take uh, sub volume. Uh, sub that and the volume on the on this in the Kubernetes. I don't I'm not sure if I'm making any sense, but yeah, we would have to check that. Right? Yeah. Honestly, the, the problem is a lot of applications don't allow you to, to live reload the secrets. So it doesn't come up that often, you know. Unfortunately. Yeah, like most of them read it as startup and then they're like, yeah, I got my secret and then off they go. Yeah, yeah but the with the subtracts. You need to see inside, right? Or, or if, if you have like in Kubernetes the subtract mounted volumes on it, and the secrets are not reloaded, not not uh, rotated, it will rotate on the mainland. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, I'd have to check the docs. But... Yeah, sorry, no answer. <laughs> Anyone else know an answer? No. Okay, at least we don't have to feel so bad. <laughs> it's interesting that question around uh, service docs, because yeah. it's a quite common question. Like how can how can we use because we, we have a concept of app nodes yeah uh, and that also comes apart so you can by using app nodes you can get multiple Kubernetes clusters to use the same call and identify them as being coming from from just Kubernetes it doesn't have to be unique or cluster yeah but then I have a question. Yeah, yeah, that's my issue about the <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to do that. No. Because <clears throat> then you're back at this problem. Uh but the secret isn't the secret that you want to get access to third party server. The secret is the vault secret. Um the app role ID and secret ID. Yes, but you can also create an app role that has only one function is to generate wrapped secret ID for other app roles. Ooh. The plot thickens. Yep. <laughs> I've, I've come to the conclusion that that seems to be quite a decent solution for many things. I call that meta approach. Yeah. Although I was an official name, I can't make that up. But, um, took me a moment to get it working, though. <laughs> yeah, it is, it, it's complex, but it works. Um, but I don't like complex, that's why I don't do it. So, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, that just brings to mind this uh, report way back it's turtles all the way down <laughs> so you know where does the abstraction you can throw as many abstraction layers as that as you want create a uh, more complex setup somewhere somewhere you gotta end it mm. and if you're automating the provisioning of kubernetes clusters which you should be anyway if you have more than one of them then why not just automate the the auth endpoint setup. I think the main problem is that you then need to reference a different mounted secrets engine in Vault, depending on the cluster you're going to. Mm -hmm. But if you're using like Vault and app sets in Vault, then you can do that very easily. But if, yeah, mm -hmm. and if you're not, well then, I'm sure there's a way. Yeah. It's just it's through machine learning. <laughs> yes, machine learning and AI. Yeah. Let's throw a neural net at it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> what happened with FPX, you know? Should we drop the rule? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> take the chain off. And <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, like to, to me, one maybe I don't know, other lot of things, and you know, you thought that if you're in a drug start of 1945. 
Thank you. Awesome. So firstly, thank you everyone for welcoming me for my first time in uh, Helsinki. Um, great experience to meet you all. Um, some of you for the first time, um, some of you for the first time in person, but we kind of knew each other remotely. Some colleagues as well that I never met in person before. This is um, really, really good to be here and speak to you today uh, about some of the things that we've been doing at HashiCorp. Uh, so you can see on the screen, uh, the subject of today's uh, talk is Rift Technical Deep Dive. Now, what is Rift? I'm going to start off saying it's not an officially supported HashiCorp tool, right? This is not a new product that you can go to a HashiCorp website and get, right? What it is, is a proof of concept tool that we're using to gather information and develop some of our existing tools to figure out how we can deliver the type of value and the type of developer experiences that you require from a security perspective. So specifically, Rift, what, what does that do? Well, Rift, it takes the idea of an event-driven approach to manage your access controls. Right? So typically when you need access to a, a system, uh, if you don't already have permissions for that, you would have to go to someone, maybe a security engineer, maybe a manager or someone like that. You would have to wait for them to grant you access and then you can go forth and, and, and actually do your job. Um, instead, what, what we do is we, we kind of take the approach and say, well, what events would lead someone to need to get access to a specific uh, set of uh, infrastructure? And how can we automate the, the approval of that workflow? Right? You'll have to forgive me. This is the first time I'm giving this talk without my uh, presenter notes. I've only got this one screen that I'm sharing. So I can't actually see the bullet points of the things I want to discuss on each slide, but I'm gonna try and do my best from memory. So Rift is just a proof of concept tool. The, the goal here is to put it out there for you to see it, for you to start forming opinions about it. And we, we're gonna treat this as a public request for comment. So we're very interested in hearing uh, your feedback and if you would use it, how you would use it, um, you know, anything that you think could be valuable to us, we, we want to know about it. So the whole point behind how this came up is that there tends to be this friction between um, security and um, productivity. Um, one analogy that I, I've given quite a few times when I discuss this concept uh, with people is I'm currently doing this major renovation project at my house. Uh, we're building extensions and we're completely re-landscaping um, our grounds. And, uh, you know, to do that, we've hired architects, uh, but we've also got building contractors who are actually building the, the, the building, actually doing the landscaping and so on and so forth. And there's a particular retaining wall in our garden. Um, and we need to be careful that we don't let that wall fall down. It's made of concrete. If it falls, it will damage the house and cost a lot of money. So the builders want to reinforce the posts of that wall with concrete. Right? But the architect, the guy who's designing the landscaping, he wants to plant nice trees there, right? And he has his design reasons for that. So now we have this conflict where the, the architect wants to plant the trees, but trees cannot grow in concrete, you know? And the builder wants to reinforce the wall. And obviously that means that we cannot plant the trees. So now you have this, this friction between the two and we need to try and find the compromise. But well, when we think about our roles as engineers and as developers, we come into this friction a lot as well, right? Um, when we think about, uh, you know, a lot of the time we probably shouldn't have access to production infrastructure and systems unless something goes wrong. Generally speaking, if you're on call, uh, you may need to jump onto maybe a database, for example. Um, but you need access to that. But the, the principle of least privilege says that you shouldn't have access to what happens. So if you get woken up at 3 a.m., what do you do? You have to wake someone else up who has the permissions to give you permissions. And then it's supposed to be temporary. Once it's resolved, the person who's given you the permissions then needs to remember to revoke your permissions. Right. So when we talk about Rift, Rift is, is primarily designed to kind of solve that problem, specifically with incident management. Now, the origins of this idea, I came up with this many years ago when I was a consultant working with a client. Uh, and this specific client, they were going through a routine audit, uh, which flagged up the fact that an intern had highly privileged access to very sensitive uh, pieces of infrastructure. Uh, this intern didn't do anything malicious of it, um, but just during this routine audit, they realized that. And when they realized that, then they go through a full investigation 
this is a very security uh, paranoid company. Uh, you literally have to go through airport scanner style things before you can get into the office. No phones, no headphones, nothing. It's only their stuff. So they're very paranoid. So when it flagged it up, the, the way that they conduct their investigation is almost like being arrested by the police. You, you go into an interview room, you're interrogated, and you know, you're not allowed to speak to anyone else who might have to be interviewed. And then they cross notes and then they come up with the, the, uh, the source of what they believe uh, the problem is and how it came to be. And essentially, when we look at how this intern uh, came to have this highly privileged uh, credentials, they were shadowing uh, a senior engineer during an incident. And the senior engineer requested that this intern be given temporary access to the system so that they may engage in the troubleshooting completely. The idea was that uh, once the incident had been resolved, that the intern's access should be revoked. And for one reason or another, it was not, you know. Um, and you know, when we, if we think about a blameless culture, it's not really anyone's fault that that wasn't revoked. You know, if I'm a security engineer and I'm supposed to revoke that access, but I have a screaming baby and I'm distracted because of that, or I forget because I'm being pulled in a different direction, that tells me I'm human, right? The real failure here was not a human failure. It was the failure to put systems in place to protect ourselves from ourselves, right? So I started thinking back then, well, surely there's a way that we can, you know, take these events as the source and we can trigger a bunch of actions and we can do the reverse as well when the incident is resolved. And this is where I came up with the idea of Rift. Let me ask a question. Yes. You came up with the idea of Rift. I did. The Rift is your, like, you created it. Yes, it wasn't called Rift. We came up with that name recently. But yeah, it was my idea from before I joined HashiCorp. Okay. Yeah. Everyone's listening a bit closer now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm full of ideas. Execution's a different story, but we managed to pull this one off. So if we look at the, the, the workflow of Rift, um, it's quite simple. Something breaks, right? Uh, and when something breaks, uh, in this example I have in the slides, uh, we're using PagerDuty. Um, for the demo, we're not going to use PagerDuty for some undisclosed reasons. Um, my demo didn't work for that one. Um, but yeah, essentially, as an engineer, I get an alert on the PagerDuty app on my phone, right? And anyone that's used PagerDuty, when you get the alert, if you're the on-call engineer, you have to hit an acknowledge button, right? What that does is that triggers a, an event to be sent to Rift, right? Um, so Rift is pretty much like a web server, if you like. It's listening for notifications, right? It gets a notification from PagerDuty to say, hey, I, the on-call engineer, Rob Barnes, has acknowledged this incident. Right? And then what it does is it goes to HashiCorp Boundary, and it grants me permissions in Boundary to access any of the underlying infrastructure related to that incident. So obviously, once I have all this access, I can now troubleshoot it. I can jump onto databases, I can jump onto VMs, whatever the issue is. I can identify the source of, of the outage. I can implement a fix. And when I'm done, I can resolve the incident, right? Now, if I don't resolve the incident on the PagerDuty app, the chances are my manager is going to call me up and say, why have I not resolved that, right? Because it's still flagging up on the dashboard somewhere to say it's not resolved and they're getting in trouble for it. Generally speaking, incidents aren't allowed to be left unresolved in organizations, or at least the ones that I've worked with in the past, right? So when I resolve that incident, Rift kicks into life again. It goes back to Boundary and says, those permissions that you gave to Rob Barnes, revoke them. And it does, right? So if we look at this workflow here, the, the integral piece of this is HashiCorp Boundary. Now, if and if you're not aware of what Boundary is, we'll just have a very brief overview of that. Boundary is HashiCorp's session access management tool, right? What, what do we mean by that? Well, you've seen a presentation earlier on today about Vault and secrets and, and, and how you can, you can gain access to third party things or, or clouds or whatever it is. And that's primarily to do with secrets and credentials, right? Identity, essentially. When you think what a password is, a password is an attestation of an identity. But you know, before I can go to this secret nightclub and say, hey, I'm Rob Barnes, let me in. I actually need to get to that nightclub first, right? Um, so you can think about Boundary as the Uber, if you like, that gets you from your location to, to, to the destination, right? Um, 
typically how we've done this in the past is we use things like bastion hosts or jump boxes or uh, vpns right uh if you're not familiar with that essentially what i do is from my laptop i ssh or something onto a, a box which has a public ip address but sits in a private uh, subnet and once i'm in that private subnet just through ssh in, uh, using a public address i can then jump to the next host. It could be another VM or something like that if it's within that private subnet. Now, the inherent problem with that is if I am only authorized to access a specific subset of infrastructure within that private subnet, uh, well, I'm already in. I can access anything I want. Sure, I have the credential issue. I need to now you know, uh, authenticate to that. Maybe I can use some hacky tools to try and figure out what those credentials are. But when we think about this principle of zero trust, um, that's still quite a high trust environment if you can just get unrestricted access to things that you probably shouldn't have. And in the zero trust, we tend to take this, uh, this thought process that we have to assume that we've already been breached. We assume that the attacker is already inside, right? So if the attacker's already inside, what do you do? And the answer to that is you have to verify everything, right? You have to verify who is this person, right? You can trust nothing. You have to verify, is this person who you've now verified their identity authorized to perform these actions, right? You can't have this, this thing where you trust everything within a perimeter, which is what we used to do in, in the old days, and then deem everything outside that perimeter to be, to be dangerous. So boundary is, is there to solve that problem. Now, I mentioned earlier on, I had this idea from years ago. I just wasn't able to implement it because boundary was the missing piece. Um, until we came up with boundary, I didn't know how we were going to do that. So I've kind of just gone through, I forgot about this slide here. I've kind of just gone through how boundary works, but we'll just kind of run through this, right? So we have a private subnet um, and we have a front end VM, we have a back end VM, we have a database and we have a boundary worker inside there. So we'll discuss a little bit about the boundary architecture here, right? So. The architecture is with boundary, it has two components. It has a controller and then it has a worker or many workers. Now a controller is the thing that as, as a user, I interact with. It's the thing I make API calls against. It's the thing I authenticate to. It's the thing that decides whether I am authorized to create sessions to targets, right? Which is another construct in boundary, which we'll discuss when we talk about the domain model. It's also the thing that orchestrates the workers as well, right? So you have the controller and the workers role in this is to do all the heavy lifting in terms of session access, right? It's the, it's the thing that will create a proxy between my laptop right here and some private subnet in Azure somewhere. Right? So the workflow is this, uh, as a user, I authenticate to the boundary controller, right? How do you authenticate? If you're familiar with things like HashiCorp Vault, we have this concept of auth methods. Boundary is very similar. We have auth methods there. Currently, we support two. The two auth methods are uh, user pass or password, which is just a username and password combination uh, for which you must create users within Boundary. Or the other one is OIDC, uh, which is a, a more pragmatic approach if you're going to be operating at any type of scale. The idea is you can bring your identity providers uh, to Boundary rather than replicating your user bases uh, within Boundary as well. So you manage that centrally which is a key theme when we talk about zero trust. You wanna manage the key components centrally. You wanna manage your secrets centrally. You wanna manage your identity centrally. So as a user, I authenticate to boundary, right? And then once I'm authenticated, I request access, that I request a session to a target, right? So essentially what I'm saying is there's that database that's in the private subnet. I want to be able to connect to that so that I can perform whatever function I need to perform, right? When I create that request, Boundary then checks my identity because obviously I've authenticated and then it checks whether I am authorized to create that session to that database, right? Now, this is going to assume the happy path. This is going to assume that I am authorized to do that. So it then schedules the worker to create my session. It says, hey, this person, Rob Barnes, is authorized to create a session. Can you create a proxy between his laptop and the target piece of infrastructure, in this case, the database? 
And then the controller does exactly, sorry, the uh, worker does exactly that. The worker goes and creates that proxy between uh, myself, the user, and the target. And that's the general workflow of how boundary works, right? Now, obviously, this is all assuming that in step three, I do have that authorization. But as we've already established in the principle of least privileged access, I probably shouldn't have access to that on the day-to-day. -day. I should only have persistent access to systems which I need to perform my role on a daily basis, right? So if we look at Rift and some of the prerequisites that are required in order for this to work, um, this is assuming the PagerDuty implementation. As I've already said, we're not going to do PagerDuty for the demo um, because I broke it. Um, well, I broke the OIDC provider that we're using, um, which is our own, by the way. But we'll just go through this anyway, and I'll explain the alternative option as I go through the demo. But essentially, uh, in order for this to work, um, we're going to discuss the domain model of boundary, right? Now, boundary operates in uh, this concept of scopes, right? At the highest level of abstraction, when you first get boundary, as the boundary administrator, you are going to log into what we call the global scope, right? And the global scope is probably going to be an organization, HashiCorp, UpCloud, like whoever, right? Within uh, that global scope, you create subscopes, which we're going to call uh, uh, the next layer down is organization scopes or org scopes, right? So an org scope may represent a department. So you may have an engineering org scope, you may have a marketing org scope, whatever. However, your, your business is, is uh, dissected and, and organized and structured, you can replicate those structures in terms of orgs, right? Now, the reason why it's called boundary as a tool is because each scope is a very uh, rigid boundary, right? It's a very rigid permissions scope. Right. So within that organization scope, um, the permissions are granted within that scope. It can't be granted to another scope. You'd have to go to that scope and then and do things on that on that level. So within the scope, you have uh, another um, sub sub scope, which we call projects. So projects are a collection of infrastructure. You know, um, it can, you can have a databases project, which houses uh, all the information for your databases. You can have a VMs uh, project, you can have a uh, memcache, whatever, however you organize your infrastructure, that's entirely up to you, right? What this allows you to do, because everything is a rigid boundary, you can assign permissions to a very tight scoped uh, kind of um, boundary, essentially. You can say that I'm only going to give permissions within this scope. You can even go more granular than that, but in terms of being a bit more higher level abstraction, this is what the scopes allow you to do. Now, if we jump back to the organization scope, there are a couple of things here. So at this level, this is where you may put auth methods, right? This is where you can configure user pass. This is where you can configure OIDC. So here uh, in this example, we have user pass enabled because we need to create a user for Rift, right? Um, Rift is going to need a highly privileged credential in order to orchestrate um, access controls on behalf of Boundary. Right? It's no different to uh, when you configure a secrets engine in Vault. The chances are whatever your target platform is that Vault is brokering that identity for, you're going to need to give Vault some kind of highly privileged account. So Rift is going to be the same thing. Right? Now, the way it works in Boundary is you have an auth method and uh, you have accounts. Now, a user can have many accounts, right? An account can be... Uh, at password level, it can be at OIDC level. It's all to do with whichever auth method it is. You associate these accounts with a user, right? Um, we also have this concept of roles as well. So roles is the access uh, permissions. Essentially, we can say that um, this role, anyone that's granted this role is able to create sessions to these infrastructure. They're able to create users. They're able to manage scopes, whatever it is that the, the permission is. Right? It's quite granular. You can tell it exactly what to do. Uh, and within projects, like we say, it houses infrastructure. So how it houses that infrastructure is split up into a bit more of a complicated domain model as well. We have this concept of host catalogs, right? So a host catalog is a collection of hosts, right? Um, within that host catalog, you have this concept of hosts and host sets. So a host would be a VM's IP address, 10.100.15.37, off the top of my head, right? That's a host. 
But what if that host is part of, say, an auto scaling group or something like that, or some kind of, uh, you know, highly uh, dependable unit where you connect to any one of these things here? Uh, it's just to make sure that things are highly available. In that sense, uh, you can create a host set, right? So, which is a collection of hosts. Both of these constructs belong to a host catalog, right? So that's just the IP address. Now the target is the port. If I wanna to connect to this host, what port do I connect to it on? And that's the target, right? And then you associate the target with the host or the host set. In the page duty example, the way that it operates is as the user in PagerDuty, uh, I would need to, obviously I have information about myself, my email address, which is all within PagerDuty. Uh, so I would need to enable in boundary the OIDC auth method, right? And the reason is uh, I can have my email address as one of the, the subjects within my, my JWT when I, when I log in. And it's through that email address that we can map it to a PagerDuty user. And that's how we know who to assign the permissions to. The reason why I'm not going to demo that one today is because we rolled our own OIDC provider and I was trying to do something slick last week and I broke it. So Rift is working. It's the OIDC provider that I broke. So that's that. But that's in terms of your prerequisites for setting up boundary, you want to set up these things here. You want to set up your projects as per your organization. You want to set up all the, the sub resources as well. And you need to make sure there's a user with a highly privileged account for Rift to use. Um, and in PagerDuty's uh, sense, you need an OIDC auth method. And I just realized there's a typo in that slide, but don't tell anyone. Now, from PagerDuty's point of view, uh, you need a couple of things, right? So it starts at the most obvious layer. You need users in PagerDuty. If I'm going to get alerts, I need to be already on a platform, right? So in the users directory, you need to create users, which you can see at the bottom. You have myself and my, my, my colleague, Eric. Um, PagerDuty also has this concept of um, escalation policies. Now, what an escalation policy is in, in PagerDuty is a set of instructions of who to contact anytime uh, something goes wrong and this escalation policy is associated with it, right? So who do I contact? Who do I escalate it to? You know, all these types of things that you can kind of chain a, a series of events together and it will uh, act accordingly, right? You also need to uh, replicate your services in there. So there needs to be some kind of representation of your infrastructure. So it has the concept of a service directory. Um, you can add a database there, you can add a VM. All it is is just, it doesn't get contain any information other than a name, right? If I get an alert for this name, these are the things I'm gonna do, right? Uh, and then finally, you need a webhook, right? Now there's a feature in PagerGC which allows you to subscribe to incidents related to services. Um, and should you get uh, an alert, then it will fire off a webhook notification to your pre-configured endpoint. In this case, that's going to be Rift. Right? So these are the things that you'd set up with PagerDuty. Um, I wish I could demo that to you today, but I need to go and figure out how I broke out a DC provider because it's not putting the right claims in. So that's where it's broken. So we'll flip over to a demo. Now I'm going to need a lot of applause for this as each step works, which hopefully it works because <laughs> This is the second time I've given this demo in the last week. It broke on my last uh, uh, live, live stream and uh, my last in-person one. And I got it working again. And then just a few hours ago in my hotel room, I thought, huh, let me just test it out again. It broke again, right? And I managed to fix it before I got here. So uh, the demo gods are really, really uh, tempting my patience right now. So if it works, cut. Can you just cheer if it breaks? <laughs> I mean, you can fix it and then you can cheer around. <laughs> okay, cool. So let's uh, flip over to. So, what we will do first is we will have a look at um, boundary, right? So, I've explained the, the uh, kind of the main model of boundary. Uh, so we'll, we'll have a walkthrough. Uh, now, I, because I didn't trust a lot of this stuff here, just because my laptop was just messing around, I've pretty much got everything set up already. Normally, I would set this up live, but it's done already. So you log in at a global scope. You can see global here. Uh, that should boost the screen size just in case um, it's hard to see. We're logged in at the global scope, right? And you can see that the global scope contains one organization, which we call the Rift Engineering Department. Now, the key thing here is uh, each scope, each resource has a unique identifier, right? And this scope here has this ID, which is O underscore 
whatever, O short for organization, right? Now, if we go into this organization, you can see it contains a project, right? That project is called databases. Now, uh, within databases, if I click into a layer deeper, then you will see uh, we have host catalogs. So we have a host catalog here, which is the Helsinki region databases, right? So these are the databases that we host in this very city. Now, if we click into that, we will see that we have a host, which is for our application HashiCups. So we have a database associated with that. So this is HashiCups database instance one, which is also part of this host set called HashiCups databases, right? So if we have several of these database instances, uh, they refer to the same deployable unit almost. Right? So from our project perspective, the, these are the resources that we have. These are the resources that we can connect, make connections to. That these are our targets that we're going to do, right? If we actually look at the target here, we have this one instance here, which is HashiCups database instance one. And you can see that it's connected to the, uh, the host set HashiCups database. So these are the things that we're going to connect to. If we go back to our orgs level, and we click into this org, we can see I have an auth method, right? Now this is the password auth method. I have not enabled OIDC. I do not need OIDC for this demo because we're not using PagerGT. We can actually use um, uh, user pass in this sense, right? And essentially what this means is at this, at this auth method level, I create accounts, right? So I've created an account called Rob, and Rob is going to be associated with a user called Rob. You can't actually see it from here. If I click onto users, you'll see there's a user called Rob. And if you see the accounts that are associated with it, it's that same account, Rob, right? So remember I said, a user can have many accounts, right? So I can have, as a user, I can have a password account and I can have an OIDC account, right? If you have several OIDC, OIDC auth methods set up, maybe you have Azure Active Directory as one OIDC provider, maybe you have Okta as another for whatever reason, I can associate all of my identities on those providers there to this one user. Uh, and that's how we've got that configured, right? Um, so that's the, the boundary structure of things. Uh, now with Alert Manager, Alert Manager is essentially uh, Grafana. It's, uh, you know, Grafana is, is a tool that allows you to create dashboards based on uh, metrics, things like Prometheus or Loki um, can feed all of that data in uh, to Grafana. Uh, and it has this, this nice feature inside it called Alert Manager where it can actually trigger alerts, right? That can be emails, it can be slacks. Um, but essentially what we have is uh, the ability to create webhooks, right? So if you're using Alert Manager as your event source and not PagerDuty, this is the prerequisite that you need for Alert Manager. You need to configure this webhook notification, right? This webhook notification will tell uh, Grafana where it should send uh, uh, these notifications to, right? And if you look at uh, uh, some of the other prerequisites for the, the alerts it's gonna send, right? There are a few labels that you're going to need to associate with it, right? The first label that you're gonna need to associate with each alert is uh, the name of the boundary project within which the infrastructure lives, right? So uh, you saw that we had a project called databases. We're gonna need to create a label that points to that, right? The second label is an alert name, right? We're gonna need to uh, configure alerts uh, and, and give it a name. So if you wanna say that the alert's called um, HashiCups databases down, that'll be the alert name, right? The best way in production, which this is not a production tool, so do not go and use this in production. I will not be responsible for any redundancies that result because of that, right? you would probably name it after the incident and maybe a time and date stamp or something like that. Right? And I'll explain why um, shortly and why that works really well. And then the third thing is Teams, right? You need to give it a label called Teams. And essentially that is going to be the ID of the boundary group, which contains the on-call engineers. Right? Uh, if I go back to boundary, I'll just show you the groups. I, I did forget to show you that. So we have a group here called DBA. Uh, and if I click into that, you can see that the members is this, this lovely gentleman called Rob, right? So those are the three things that you're going to need to configure uh, within Grafana's alert manager. Now, if I flip to, uh, where's my terminal? Here we go. If I flip to my terminal here, like I said, I didn't really trust my demo to work. So I've already started this up now. 
I've coded this in a very verbose way. It's not secure. You can see passwords and everything inside that. And I've done that because this is a request for comment. I want you to see what's going on under the hood. I want you to see what information it's using to make connections to Boundary. It's using Boundary's API. It has to take uh, credential information, just like any other system would, and it has to exchange that for a Boundary token, uh, which essentially is your client, right? So essentially, when you start up the, the Rift uh, application, you have to give it a config file. And in that config file, you tell it a, a bunch of information. And then it will then, when it starts up, create that, that boundary client. Uh, so let's have a look at the config file. Let's bring this down a little bit and boost the size of this. Awesome, right? So it's just a JSON config file. Uh, I know the first question I'll probably get from people is, why didn't you do it in HCL? Um, well, you should try implementing uh, applications that use HCL. It's uh, not straightforward. The JSON is very well understood. So we wanted the quickest time to market in terms of our, our request for comment. So we did JSON, right? Um, so the first thing we have is the log level, right? Uh, so what type of information do we want it to output in our, our log stream? Now, because we're doing a demo here, we've done everything for both. So we're using debug mode, which tells you everything that's going on, right? Uh, we have this second section, which is page duty. It's not really relevant because we're not using that for this demo. But if we were using page duty, we would set that to true and we would give it the page duty API token, right? So that's the first secret that you need to put in there. Now, you can actually set these secret values uh, using environment variables. Like I say, I'm trying to show you what's going on on Clifford. So I've not done that. And my whole environment is contained within my laptop. So good luck trying to get that. Uh, we have alert manager enabled as well. Um, so that's the next section. If you're using alert manager, which we are for this, um, you would need to enable that. And then we have the boundary configuration. So now you know a little bit about boundary. You can see that we need to tell it the organization scope that we're operating within. So that's the ID that I pointed out to you in the beginning of our boundary talk, right? Then need to tell it the address of the, of the boundary controller, which is localhost. It's all on my machine. And then you need to tell it how to authenticate to Boundary, right? So remember I showed you that we had a password auth method that was in there? Well, this is the ID of that password auth method. Right? And we're giving it the username and password, admin, password, right? Very secure. So when you start up the Boundary server with this config file, it's just a very uh, simple command uh, where you can see rift dash config dash file equals the file, just the JSON file. And this is what gives you your Rift server, right? Now, we have Boundary configured. We have Grafana configured. Uh, and we have Rift configured, right? So before we test anything, let's firstly, as the, the, the user, Rob, let's log in and let's just have a look and see what we can see. When I was showing you around Boundary, I was showing you around as a highly privileged admin user. But as the normal engineer, I'm not going to have that permission there. I'm, I'm just going to have Rob's permissions, right? So if we move over to this, you can see here, this is the Boundary desktop client. So the different ways that you can connect to Boundary, you, you have the web UI, which I showed you. Um, if you are going to administer Boundary, you're probably going to use that, or you're going to use the CLI, which you can do everything in the CLI, or you're going to use the API, right? But in terms of creating sessions, you're not going to create sessions using the web UI. That's just not possible. Right? You can only create sessions using the CLI and this boundary desktop client, right? which obviously fits more into either a developer workflow or uh, maybe a non-technical person may just want to use this desktop client here. But this is pointed to my boundary server. And you can see I can choose which scope to log into. Remember, we said that everything has its own rigid uh, perimeter. So if I have an auth method at global scope, well, that's the scope I'm logging into. As Rob, I'm going to log into the Rift engineering department because that's where my user lives. Right? So if I click on that, put in my username as Rob and my password. And it's not working. There you go, Mr. Tope, Mr. Tope. Let's try again. And it lets me in, right? So this is what I see as a user, right? I see which targets are available for me to connect to, none at this moment. And I can see any sessions that I have active or previously had active. Again, none. I can't see anything else, right? Now, if I was a security engineer, 
if I have permissions to see the, the targets and the sessions that people have created, I can remotely kill people's sessions, right? So let's just say that Rob is on holiday, for example, but you notice there's a connection from Rob's account in the logs going to a specific target. And you think, well, hold on, this is not right. Rob's on a beach in Cuba somewhere. How comes they have a live session? Well, the first thing you want to do is you want to kill that session and then you'll investigate afterwards. So as a security engineer, you can you can kill that session and you can revoke any permissions that allowed that session to happen in the first place while you investigate the source of that. Maybe Rob's not enjoying Cuba so much and he's decided to do some work from the beach. Highly unlikely, but you know, it's a possibility. We should find out, right? But as things stand, I do not have access to any infrastructure whatsoever. Right? So I'll log out and then we will see if we can change that. So if I go back to, um, we go back to Alert Manager, we have this webhook notification set up and you saw the logs in, in Rift, right? You saw that a server has just started, nothing has happened, right? So if we go ahead and test this webhook notification, you can see these labels um, that, that we've set up, right? Remember I said, we need the project within boundary which the infrastructure belongs to. The project is called databases. We need the name of the alert that we're going to fire off. It's going to be called HashiCups DB outage. You can probably automate that to be timestamped and dated so that you have a, a everything regarding that incident under one scope. And then you need the teams that are associated with this piece of infrastructure. So there's a team of engineers, Rob, who's responsible for uh, the databases within our infrastructure. And this team is called DBA, right? Now we need the ID of that team. And uh, you saw when I showed you the boundary page, I'll show it again. Uh, if we go to the details of this group, this is the group ID here at the top. Uh, and when we look at our Kibana, you can see that's the ID that's there, right? So if I hit set, uh, send test notification, this is gonna send something to boundary. And if this works, I demand a clause. You can send it to Rift, right? It's going to send it to Rift, yes. I did not work a few hours ago. I had to restart my laptop. I was very upset. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm not that good at front end. <laughs> right, okay. So if we look at this, uh, I'll just boost this screen. I'll get rid of this for a second you can see some things have happened, right? You can see uh, that Riff received an incident. It created a role in Boundary called HashiCups DB Outage. And it's given you a list of targets within, within Boundary that um, it's assigning permissions for, right? It's added that to the role. And what it's done is this assigned this role that is created to that group in Boundary, right? As you've seen, I am a member of that group in Boundary. So where that group had no permissions to access any infrastructure whatsoever, I should now be able to access that, right? So let's go back to our Boundary desktop client. Let's choose our scope, which is Rift Engineering Department. And we'll log in as Rob. We'll type my password correctly this time, log in. And there you are. I think this is as a round of applause. It's, it's Rob, right? We have our target that we can now make a connection to. We can see it, we can make that connection to it, right? Let's do that. Let's, let's connect to it. So this is where it gets really, really interesting, right? So it's created a proxy from my machine to this piece of infrastructure, which is in a private submit, right? But it's done something else on top of that, right? What it's done is it's given me a username and a password to connect to. This is dynamically generated. What I'm trying to tell you is we have an integration between Boundary and Vault. So not only can I create sessions to my target piece of infrastructure, I can also say when that session is created, give me these credentials from Vault, right? Which is really nice. So what I've done is I configured the database secrets engine in, in um, Vault to point to my database and it is dynamically creating credentials. When the session is killed, it would also revoke those credentials from Bolt, right? So we can copy it or we can see it. You're not gonna be able to hack my stuff because it's all on my laptop and I'm not on the public internet. So I don't mind showing you this, it's fine. 
you can see that the username is v token on call and a series of things that I'm not going to repeat. And you can see this password, which is interestingly a lot shorter than the username. Go figure. I need to connect to this piece of infrastructure using the port 64262, right? So what I'll do is I'll copy that and I will head back to my terminal. Just bring this down a bit. Uh, we'll just come over here, clear that. Now, I'm gonna want to, let me just go to my readme because I can never remember the SQL commands. Here we go. Right. I'll copy that and I'm probably gonna have to paste my stuff again, right? So basically I need to tell it what port that I, I want to connect to. And I don't know why I've gone past it, forgive me. And the port was, I cannot for the life of remember, it was 64262, right? So 64262. And the user that I need to connect to, which we'll get from the integration between boundary and vault. And that user is this long thing here, which you know the desktop client gives you this nice thing where you can just click on a copy button and it copies it for you. And we'll paste that there. If we hit enter, it's asking for the password. And we'll copy the password from this desktop client. We'll paste it here. Oh, what have I done? I don't know what I've done there. I've broken something. So this is what happens when you don't clap. We'll, we'll go again. We'll go again. We'll be cheer instead, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, why is it not asking me for anything? There we go. So asking for that. And then we'll take the password. And this was working as well before. So uh, I don't know what's broken there. Something's it's broken with this. Oh, did I forget that? I think I did. Yes, I think I did. Let's go again. And thank you. This is why you don't cheer. <laughs> uh, we'll do it right here. So do dash D, and I think it's going to be called Postgres because we haven't done anything with that. And then let's make sure I've copied that. Paste and now we're in. Now I need that. I didn't see who chatted out that, that prompt there. Whoever you are, oh, you're a blessing. What was your name, sir? France. France. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're on the recording for life now. You saved the watch. Right? But I just heard English when saying thanks, France. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So we're in. Um, I do some stuff. I troubleshoot the incident and I implement a fix, right? Um, so now I'll just kill the session. Actually, before I kill the session, we'll just quickly have a look here and you can see that we have an active session here. So it's got a session ID. You can see what target I'm connected to. You can see the proxy that is created and the time that it was started, right? I'll just hit cancel from here. And that'll take a little while to cancel and eventually, that will kick out. But here's the thing. Um, we now need to revoke those permissions, right? So once uh, Grafana has turned around and said, this incident is resolved, then it's going to send another webhook notification to Rift, which is going to orchestrate the access controls, right? It's taking its well. If those privileges are revoked um, due to the resolve of the problem, does it kick you out of the database immediately? Yes, yes. Okay. Well. The process starts, as you can see, I'm still in, still in the database. It, it takes however long boundary takes to actually kill that session uh, remotely, right? Or maybe if I type some stuff, I don't know. It's going to take its time to do that. But essentially, from boundary's point of view, it's going to kill that session, right? Um, and it's going to revoke the the permissions that it got from, um, well, sorry, the credentials it got from Vault, essentially. Now, because we were just testing the webhook, there's no way for me to send a resolved um, kind of webhook notification to Rift without kind of spoofing it and just kind of creating my own kind of call post. Um, so that's exactly what we're going to do, right? I have a payload, which I pre-prepared. I'm not going to bother showing you that because essentially you don't normally don't interface with these things here. Normally it's all done under the hood for you, but because I use the test functionality, I'm having to do the revocation manually, right? So if I, make this API call, what I'm doing is I'm sending a payload to Rift 
to say that the incident is resolved, right? And I do that, and if we head over to Rift, you'll see that it's deleted the role. So if I exit out of here and I sign in again, so Rob, oh, have I, oh, I've typed in the wrong scope, my bad. And now again, no longer have permissions to see or make connections to our infrastructure. And that's the whole point of this whole thing is it's event driven. Uh, and it's the, it's the type of type of workflow that I've been trying to explore for years. Um, and essentially we have something working. Now it's a proof of concept. So it's not implemented in the most secure way. There are things that I would probably add to this in the future, uh, things like uh, HMAP verification. Uh, you saw the way that I was able to spoof the revocation. Equally, you can spoof the, the granting of, of permissions. If we can start to have uh, verification of, of the source of these things here, then th this is where we're production hardened in it. I may do that, I may not, because the idea is, do we want Rift to be a thing, or do we just want the value of Rift and we want to integrate it into our existing tooling? Um, which is the question that we are here to answer, right? So I'll come back to my presentation. Because what is next for Rift, right? What do we do? Do we um, create more event sources? Like, I don't know how many people are using PageDuty. I don't know how many people are using Alert Manager. Maybe they're using Datadog. Maybe you're using Zabbix. I don't know. Um, do we kind of gather this information and make it a thing? Um, or should this be directly integrated into Boundary? Um, you know, if you have Boundary, can you like maybe enable plugins or something like that? How, how would you want to to consume this business value? Would you even need this in your organizations? Would you be interested in these things? So what's next for Boundary is us kind of ask, asking those questions and, and getting answers. And through talks like this and conversations like this, the idea is that you go away and you think about these things and, and you just share your thoughts with us and, and you discuss it with the community and just kind of learn from one another. And as HashiCorp, we can listen to that and we can build products specifically with Boundary. One of the approaches we've taken with Boundary is, you know, when, when the first version of Boundary was released, it was very bare. It didn't have a lot of features. And we did that deliberately, right? We could have made our MVP a bit more complete, but we decided that actually, we want to make sure that we build the right product that people want to use rather than thinking we know what people want to use and making the wrong assumptions. So if you look at Boundary today, things like the credential management that you saw uh, coming directly from Vault, these are the result of direct feedback given from people that were just kicking the tires and trying things out and thinking, what would it take for me to use this in production? They told us the answers, we implement the answers, right? So in terms of what's next for Rift is, is trying to understand what your questions are, trying to get some of the answers to some of those questions, trying to figure out what it would take for you to use this type of business value, would you even consider it? If you wouldn't, that's totally fine as well. This is an experiment, right? So how can you help? Like I've said, I, I, I want to hear from, from, from everyone that has any thoughts on this whatsoever. I want to hear if you have any concerns from a security perspective, from an operational and productivity perspective, from any perspective whatsoever. I want to hear what event sources that you would use, uh, that you would require support for. I want to hear how you would like to use this thing here. Would you like to enable a plugin? Would you want the ability to write your own plugins? Um, you know, um, do you even want it to be integrated into Boundary or do you want Rift to be a separate thing? I can't imagine many people want to manage another tool on top of their already huge tool set, but you know, you never know. Um, the point is, I just want to hear the feedback from people so that uh, the discussions I'm having with the Boundary product management team can be a bit more realistic to what people want rather than what we think people want, which is very, very important to us, right? So I have a QR code there. Uh, a QR code will take you to a, a, I don't know how you say this, maybe a link tree site or something. I think that's how you say it, right? Um, this is where you can download the binary for Rift. Um, the documentation, I've actually taken it down because I was trying to launch the website a few hours ago and uh, I had some issues there. Uh, I'm gonna launch the documentation website to help you get started with that uh, over the next week or so. Um, and there's also a link for you to open up GitHub issues just to provide any comments, feedback, questions, whatever it is, right? Um, if you have any thoughts whatsoever, please, 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 I implore you, please do just, just open up an issue there. Um, there's no template or anything you have to follow. Just literally just, just give us your thoughts. Just ask, ask your questions. We'll do our best to answer them. Or just if you have um, 
feedback, just just post it in there or any any uh, suggestions or anything like that. Um, we're here to listen. That's the goal of this thing. This is a very public request for comment, and we are requesting your help. Um, I can't offer any commitment as to what an implementation looks like or when an implementation uh, will be uh, live. Um, all I can say is that we're thinking about this now so that in due course, we can do the right things for you. And that's literally it. That's, that's what I came to show you today. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions. Yeah. Uh, Question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, sorry. Um, so my knowledge with the brown boundary is very limited, but um, I'm starting to think that what is actually RIP doing here? So what if we just create the RIP book from Grafana or from the other manager straight away to boundary? I see that there are like APIs uh, for the boundary. So if you spread it, so what is actually RIP so adding? What Rift is adding is the orchestration, right? So Boundary doesn't have the ability to listen to webhook notifications, right? That's kind of one of the questions is should it have the ability to do that, right? And what kind of attack vectors does that open up and how can we close those attack vectors? That's a good question. Like, um, I'd actually appreciate you opening up an issue and asking that question there because these are the things that we, we can really think about, you know, what does that implementation look like? So all Rift is doing essentially is it, it's basically a, a webhook server, so web server, it's listening to those notifications. When it gets a notification, it acts accordingly according to the payload that's been delivered to it. Right. So you can almost think about the way we built Rift almost as a plugin architecture itself. It has a page duty plugin, it has an alert manager plugin. It will have whatever other plugins that people suggest that we should build because that's the things that they're using. Um, currently, you cannot do that in Boundary. Boundary is not designed for that. I don't think anyone thought about that use case until this came up. Um, so that's the role of, of, of Rift in this case. And um, I think you asked the key question, why isn't this in boundary, right? And I'd love to hear if other people have the same question or have the same desire. Yeah. Uh, question about the like most uh, kind of type of boundary. Mm -hmm. well, let's say you had a, an in-house product and you'd like to uh, have access to that. Let's say they had, had a public web portal that you had a admin account and so on, uh, in case you have to go there and do some troubleshooting and so on. I, I think that we could possibly uh, do that, but uh, it should be, we've integrated something else to grant that uh, access right to this. So, so the way, the way at this stage. So I understand what you're saying, right? So the, 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 way, the way that Rift is designed is to get access to things like what you just did via boundary, right? Um, instead of doing something directly to a piece of infrastructure. Um, it's kind of stateless, the, the, the way that we build it. I think when it comes to kind of managing state, it gets very, you know, we, we've had so many iterations of this. Um, it was my idea, but I didn't build this alone. I built this with, with, with a couple of friends of mine at HashCorp. Um, we, this is probably like maybe the fourth implementation of the idea. We've done things in a stateful way and it was a nightmare um, from a, developer experience point of view. Um, so the best way for us to be able to orchestrate that access control is to use something centralized, which understands how to decode protocols, right? Uh, and that's exactly what, what Boundary can do. It can decode anything that's TCP. Um, it can be a Postgres connection. It can be SSH. It can be, you know, um, uh, how do you say the RabbitMQ thing, the MPQ, whatever it is? whatever it's called, right? The, um, that protocol, whatever protocol it is, it can decode these things here. And, you know, I've done it from the command line. I've seen people take their database management systems and literally grab the information from Boundary and stick it straight into that. So you can use the tooling that you want to use to interface with the target infrastructure. Would we support anything outside Boundary? Maybe, you know, if, if, if the community decided that Rift has to be a thing and we want it to be separate from Boundary, possibly, yeah. Um, it just kind of depends on, on the integration points. Now, what makes all of this possible is APIs, right? Now, when you think about what APIs give you is the ability to glue things together into a, a workflow. Um, so I'm getting this right. The question is not like, uh, can I use something else than boundary, but like, why would I use it because of boundary for this? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see why you wouldn't. I mean, you can use Bastion if you want but then you open yourself up to those same flaws, right? Um, I gave, um, I've, I've given a few talks. I gave a talk at um, 
uh, the Uptime Conference in Amsterdam uh, a few weeks back uh, about Zero Trust. And in that talk, I told the story of one of my previous customers um, who had some intellectual property stolen from them by an inside threat actor. Threat actor. There's, a, there's a guy called Keiju, uh, was, was the person that, that stole the intellectual property. Uh, long story short, he wasn't very happy with his, um, with, with his bonus package. He was expecting 1.1 million pounds as a bonus and he was given 400,000 pounds. So he decided to leave and take some intellectual property with him, right? He was a quant researcher. And what quant researchers do is they put together mathematical algorithms, which basically automate uh, the buy and the selling of stock, right? Uh, it's like a computer way of trading. Um, so the the, um, the 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 algorithms that they 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 create that's that's considered intellectual property. Now, because he was a disgruntled employee who had privileged access to things, right? Um, he was able to steal his colleagues' um, algorithms. And the way that this company did it is they don't store these algorithms together. They actually scramble them so they store different parts in different places. So he just sat there and wrote a decompiler that just literally took all the different things and stitched it up into its own uh, algorithm. And yeah, he, he he stole that and secured another job probably because he had those those algorithms and, and other hedge funds would be interested in that. Um, but yeah, uh, long story short, this guy went to prison and has been convicted three times for the same crime. Uh, this is all on Google. You can look it up. The guy's name is Keiju. Uh, very interesting story. Um, how could that have been avoided? Well, you know, if everything was centralized and everything was controlled uh, from a governance point of view centrally, then firstly, you would have seen that he was accessing certain things, right? Uh, and that's the first red flag that would have been ingested into the security system. Secondly, you could have done something about it uh, as soon as you seen that. Uh, even without him knowing that you've known straight away, unless obviously his decompiler stops working, he's sitting there thinking, what's going on? It's because you've killed his access, right? Um, why would you use uh, anything but boundary? You know, people have been using stuff outside boundary. I think people are gonna start to see the light that this is the way to go. You need something that is going to be very specific to, to your targeted endpoints. I think they use the word target in the domain model very uh, uh, consciously because that's where you need to get to, not over here, not over there to this piece of infrastructure. This, this is what you're authorized to do. Um, so your boundary for me is, I'm, I'm very confident that this is gonna have mass adoption in the next few years. Um, there's, there's a lot of excitement in the, the security community about it at the moment. Um, and we have a couple of ways that you can run this. You can run this self-hosted as a binary, uh, or my preferred method is you can run this uh, on the HashiCorp pl platform. It means that we manage it for you. What you do is you implement your, your uh, security posture within there. You implement your own uh, access controls. You implement your auth methods and your org scopes, whatever it is, according to your organization. And we manage the infrastructure and all the binary upgrades for you. Because um, who wants to manage stuff themselves unless they haven't got a choice, right? Good stuff. Well, thank you. Laura, are you prepared to drive yeah. up of the, all the stuff we have discussed today? All right, and especially thanks to all the presenters, and especially the ones that ha have come far to this nice little town. So a uh, big hand to everyone who gave a presentation. And thanks for UpCloud once again, sponsoring the venue and, and the snacks. And thanks for every one of you for attending. I see a few uh, new people here as well. So. Great, thank you. And as always, we're going to make available all these slides and the uh, recording of this meetup in the near future. Some of them are already uh, uploaded there, but I will inform the meetup group when that is done. And as this is a a like community meetup by community for the community. Uh, we'd like to hear from you and we'd like to have people as presenters and other sponsor stuff. Feel free to contact me either via uh, email or you can hit me up on LinkedIn. And yeah, uh, 
when is the next meetup? We haven't really planned anything, but like this is supposed to be a quarterly one. Now drifting a little bit from that promise, but hopefully uh, sometimes uh, in the beginning of next year, like if it's going to be in the first quarter. Uh, I have an idea to like, of course, this is a nice format to have presentation and so on, but I'm thinking about like they could be something else. Like recently I was in the Kubernetes meetup, which had this uh, Greenfield discussion. Like if there's interest for that, that would be nice. Have an interactive session and so on. And of course, to involve hobbies and new people to the scene would have a also a, a very basic, uh, like a talk, uh, meetup about a very basic topics. Like, so if you are, thinking that would you like to present something but it's not novel or uh very niche or something but you could uh throw a mean introduction to terraform like get in touch with me it would be nice why not and uh hopefully we'll have a date for the next meetup soon but in the meantime like they say hash it talks deploy it's a virtual event next week and there's the link for it and also in the meetup group uh, there is an Event. So if you haven't seen that, uh, be sure to check it out. And that that's my part. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>